Forest YouTube channel has Shoshi, Dapp developer. Welcome to Crypto 101, sir. Hey, thanks for having me, man. Super stoked to be here. Bro, before we get into the whole conversation about quantum computing, is it going to f*** Bitcoin straight up? Who are you? Tell us about, about what you're doing in the crypto space. Awesome. Yep. Uh, so like you said in the intro, my name is Forrest. Uh, I have a YouTube channel called Hishoshi where I talk about cryptocurrency, distributed tech, everything blockchain. That's my passion. It's what I do for my full-time job as a developer. And I'm super happy to be on these podcasts, be able to talk about this uh, every single day for 12 hours a day, pretty much. It's awesome. Right on, man. What, so you're, you're a dev developer, man. What, what, are you, what are you working on right now? Anything you could tell us about? Yeah, so I've been working a lot with Ethereum and some of the component technologies that have come out of Ethereum. Um, so you know, we're looking at the um, the EOSs of the world, the Tron, Zilliqa, um, Cardano. I've been working with a lot of that stuff that's really stemmed from what Ethereum has done. So trying to get my hands um, in all of the the smart contract based platforms that are out there today. Cool, man. Well, that's awesome. But the conversation today we're going to have is, will quantum computing break Bitcoin's encryption? And if it's breaking Bitcoin's encryption, it's breaking encryption all over the world. I kind of want to know a couple of things. I want to know what is quantum computing first. And then I just want to just go down the rabbit hole to figure out if there's solutions to this eh, emerging technology, which is actually an emerging problem for encryption. So please break it down to us. What is quantum computing? Awesome. Yeah. So in a nutshell, quantum computing is a next generation computing technology that has vastly more power than our traditional computers. And it's a technology, like you said, that's threatening to de completely destroy our modern encryption, signing and key generation capabilities. You know, quantum computers, they use raw electrons and photons called qubits uh, to facilitate that same binary zero and ones operations that our current computers use optical pulses to produce. So we have these silicon chips right now that sit in our computers. They have little transistors that could be in two states, a zero or a one. And that's what runs the base level of computation that our computer does on a day-to-day -day basis. The concept of quantum has been around for a long time. I think there were papers about it in the 70s and you know even in the 80s and 90s. But the technology now and, and the hardware that's required to, to facilitate that and create that is just now starting to mature. Uh, so it's it's definitely coming around the bend. So you said it's vastly more powerful. What does it mean by vastly more powerful? And also, I heard a little thing that you have to keep a quantum computer at basically either absolute zero or near absolute zero to function. Can you just tell us a little bit about the inner workings and what does it all mean? Yeah, so I think it's good to always compare it to what we have now. Um, so in a computer chip right now, we have a concept of bits. You know, we have a series of microscopic transistors that are woven together in these silicon chips. And each of these transistors has a state of positive or negative charge, the zero or one. So, I mean, you hear the concept of bits and bytes or the zeros and ones that a computer thinks in. That's what it's referring to. It's quite literally what's happening on your computer's chip. Now, even though there are enough transistors in a modern computer chip to match the number of atoms in the entire Milky Way galaxy that we live in, the ability of our current technology in terms of how much calculation power that there is and how much power there is in those individual bits pales in comparison to that of a qubit in quantum computing. And a qubit stands for quantum bits. So it's quite literally just the next generation of the bits we're used to. Um, and so you're totally correct that to work with a quantum bit, you have to isolate photons or electrons in a super cooled vacuum environment. And then those qubits can be manipulated by uh, stimuli, whether lasers or microwaves, et cetera, to um, facilitate that same sort of action that a computer would take uh, using electricity and these little pulses. Uh, but just to put it into scale, 300 qubits, and just to let you know, there are insane numbers of, of bits in our traditional computer chips, but only 300 qubits can facilitate more binary values, the zeros or ones, than there are atoms in the entire known universe that we can possibly fathom in our minds today. So the exponential capacity of a qubit, even in that small scale, is pretty insane compared to what we have today because that's, it's 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 amazing. Dude, that's that's insane. I'm trying to wrap, wrap my brain around like what does that mean? Because I think when we look at computers, we think about speed, we think about megahertz right. or, or gigahertz or, 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 or what have you. What how do you compare that to like the speed of a computer? I, I st I'm still trying to figure trying to grasp it like something more tangible, something I'm more sure. used to. So let's take it down another, you know, take it to another level here. So when you're, we talk about these zeros and ones and the ability for your computer to um, have all these different transistors that can be in a different state, that 
capacity is what allows your computer to make calculations, to make decisions, to do all these things that you're asking it to do. So when you program in a language today, that's getting compiled down to a machine level language and then down into that assembler, like base level computer language, the zeros and ones. So the more access to state changing bits that you have, these qubits or bits in your chip, the more power your computer has to work with to do these actions that you're telling it to do. So almost out of, out of a sci-fi movie, qubits also have a property called superposition, which means that qubits, they move so fast and they have this special property that they can be in a state of zero and one at the same time, right? <laughs> which is insane. It wow. almost sounds like Star Trek, to be honest. But that means that it opens the door to have calculation speeds and the flexibility at this qubit level that's beyond anything that we've ever dreamt of from a uh, hardware capacity. So there's so many unique properties that I couldn't possibly get into all of them today that are, are very f- rooted in physics. But if, if we can learn as, you know, as a society to harness qubits the way that we have these transistors in our computer chips, which we will, it's inevitable, it will make the computers we have today look like dial-up full-size room computers that we had in the uh, in the 80s and 90s. That's insane, dude. So when I'm thinking about quantum and what you just said, it's in, in a state of one and zero at the same time. I'm thinking of what like China was doing like a, like last year or two years ago when they were having uh, quantum entanglement with st- satellites and they're in, this, in the same state at the same time and having like instantaneous communication. Is, is it kind of the same thing? Yeah, very much the same, just at, at the most microscopic, granular level you can think of for a computer. But it's very similar where it, it's so fast that it's both at the same time in a way that's how you can think of it bro that's 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 ridiculous to even think about yeah so, and ultimately it's because this is it's a molecular technology it's a like an atomic technology in a way so if it is at the same state at the same time it can do things simultaneously so with computers right now everything is kind of linear right so if you're working on say like cracking a uh, hashing hashing algorithm you're just working through numbers and taking guesses uh just literally one one number the next number the next number the next number but this one would work on it like all at the same time correct theoretically yes but i think even at more at, at a deeper level you're looking at the ability for these transistors that are in your computer chips today they can only be in one state at a given time they rotate between those and so if you can be in the same state at the same time you're basically exp- you're exponentially improving your ability to make these calculations in terms of speed so it's not necessarily about being able to synchronously do things at the same time, whereas before everything was asynchronous, it's more about the speed at which you can complete those tasks is vastly improved because of that ability for the the bits themselves to process the information faster. But just to quell the overall mind-blowing aspect of this technology, qubits are still really hard to control and very expensive to isolate in the first place. Like We haven't yet been able to fully harness the potential that these things have, and like you said early on in this conversation, these tiny particles and keeping them at the colder than deep space temperatures that are required for them to operate is no easy feat. So it's not as if tomorrow we're going to have a quantum computer that's even close to the capabilities that we're speaking about here, but we're really speaking about the theoretical potential of them right now. All right, man, I'm going to I'm going to jump down the rabbit hole. I'm not going to go into Bitcoin quite yet. We will get there and hopefully in, in like one or two minutes. But if quantum computers were able to be like fit into the palm of your hand like a cell phone, what, what would you imagine the daily use case for the average person? What, what could you do with a quantum computer in the palm of your hand? If you had quantum capabilities in the palm of your hand, I, I believe that you would have the most intelligent, smart interface possible. I think it would enable deep neural network analytics to occur at, you know, within your phone. I think it would be able to tell you how to make decisions on certain things. It would know what it is that you're looking for before you even ask for it. Those sorts of things that drive some of the technology that we're seeing today in Tesla's cars, for example, that would just be an everyday thing if, if we had this type of technology, because packing that into one phone would be amazing. Have you seen the TV show Travelers? I have. Yeah, and they have the quantum computer, which is the, what is it, the director? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it kind of like hangs around and just makes all the decisions for humanity, and humanity just goes out and executes its orders. You you think that's what it could be? Potentially. I I don't know how far I would get into a dystopian future, but it's possible. That's the reality, though, is is it's all about, you know, naturally how this becomes commercialized, because that's what it will ultimately be, and then how it's integrated into what we already do. All right, man, I, I'm, I'm, I'm digging myself out of this rabbit hole. What does this mean for modern encryption? Let's just go take it back to day zero again. For sure. So even though quantum computing right now has not reached even close to its full potential, even though it is not even close to mainstream adoption in cost, in effectiveness, et cetera, 
it is coming. And the reality is, is that with this power, we realize that our current system of asymmetric encryption using public key and private key, so RSA, that runs the majority of our web infrastructure today and a lot of our applications and the encryption that encrypts all of our data is very much at risk. Um, so there's a common topic that comes up called Shor's algorithm. Uh, and, and that is a theoretical algorithm that talks about how quantum could potentially address the main challenge that's posed that makes this asymmetric encryption we have today hard to break. So without diving too deeply into exact numbers, the concept here is that Shor's algorithm relies on the ability for quantum computers to facilitate prime factorization. And what that basically means is, is it's finding the two prime numbers that multiply into a massive other prime number, right? Because that's really all a, a public key is doing. You're decrypting with this massive prime number at a really base level. And then because you can't break that massive prime number into its component pieces, you can't decrypt that message unless you have the key values, right? Mm -hmm. So because prime factorization is so difficult, it takes months or years or even multiple Never. years forever <laughs> to, to break right. these things today with our current processing power speeds. And there are cases where 1024 bit prime numbers were taking six to eight months to break using common infrastructure today. It's not that those things aren't secure, but it's the theoretical limits of quantum computing blows the lid off of what we have today. What does that mean for Bitcoin? And it, it, let's just not say Bitcoin, because that's what we're talking about, because, you know, it's a crypto show. We're crypto people. But what does that mean for the world? Let's we'll start at Bitcoin, and then let's talk about the different aspects that makes this technology dangerous to what we have set up today in security. Right. It's a threat to everything, first of all. But like you said, let's focus on Bitcoin. Bitcoin especially uses a lot of this technology in terms of key signing. Like your, your account as a Bitcoin user is reliant on this public private key asymmetric encryption technology. So if that is broken and prime factorization is easy enough and fast enough at scale in a short amount of time and at low cost, theoretically, Bitcoin's entire signing structure and the ability to predict someone's private key from their public key or, or derive it is possible now. And that is ultimately devastating to Bitcoin, right? So at a, at a base level, that's the main risk. But beyond that, you know, consensus as well, which is very proof of work driven hashing. As we know, you have a lot of people specializing hardware like ASICs, and those are lightning fast. But quantum computers and the ability for quantum proof of work, for example, let's just say you have an extremely wealthy party, like a multinational corporation that has enough resources to get the first quantum computer that's capable of, of challenging this hash rate that there is out there today for Bitcoin. Theoretically, mm -hmm. the most resource rich and powerful group could overwhelm the network with this new technology if we don't prepare now. Uh, and it's the same threat of a 51% attack. It's just from a different avenue. So in summary, quantum computing could just break Bitcoin's security altogether, just destroy the whole the whole blockchain. It could it could break the core the core infrastructure that Bitcoin relies on. Yes. Also, if they didn't want to do that, the first quantum computer, if it had enough qubits, it could just, you know, destroy, say, all these mining pools. This one guy could come over and just start mining and then Bitmain and all these other uh, pools are just done and it takes the whole um, hashing power or the majority of the mining for Bitcoin. Yeah, I, I mean, just to put this into even more explicit terms, I was reading a paper the other day about this very issue and it was basically projecting the hash power, the feasible hash power for these the uh, Bitcoin network with ASICs and GPUs, and then the hash power capability of quantum computing for one single quantum computer. Super cool. Over time, right? Granted, this is far away, but mm -hmm. I don't want this to make people think we don't have to care about it now. Mm -hmm. But it was amazing how close one quantum computer was to the projected total hash rate of the entire Bitcoin network. Stop. By 2040. Stop. Like, it was within nine factors of 10 which Stop. is big in terms of our thought of numbers, but not big for computers, right? That is the that is the gravity of the situation. And it's not to say that we can't tackle this problem, but we need to be thinking about it now. But, at least but you said, you said, but the thing you said is the entire hash rate of the network, all you need is 51%. So even half the hash rate of the network, you're causing a shit ton of trouble. You're right. Yeah. And so it, that, again, it isn't... Uh, this isn't this isn't a, a, like a, a game of, of FUD. And I feel like the place we are in this space right now, and I understand why anyone who talks about big problems gets sort of labeled with the little FUD label, right? Right. Like, oh, that's that's not an issue we're, we're we're building right now. 
We are, mm-hmm. but we need to be thinking further in the future about more things than just price. Right. So what can Bitcoin do to prepare or defend? Is there something like a quantum algorithm or a quantum uh, encryption that Bitcoin can switch to? Is there some sort of uh, quantum, say, network or, or, or mining pool that we can switch to? What are the, some of the thoughts that are coming out from defense of Bitcoin when quantum computing becomes mainstream. For sure. And I think this is the exact right conversation. Like you don't wait until a hurricane makes landfall to go to the supermarket and get water, food and batteries. You prepare way ahead of time so that you're ready when that storm hits. Right. So in my opinion, there are a couple of avenues here. The first one is I think everyone who is a core developer for a, pl- a protocol, this isn't just about Bitcoin either. It's, it's everyone. It's also the cer- certifying authorities for the web. Everyone needs to be focused on tracking what's going on with quantum computing and understanding every single year where we're looking at forecast wise for how powerful these things are going to be. And right now in the short term, I think we can start to push our key size in bits higher and higher, right? I think right now we're at 2048 bits, which is really difficult for traditional hardware to to break. It would take decades to do, in my opinion. If we can continue to push that envelope and make those keys even more difficult and the encryption even more secure in terms of bit depth, then I think that's extremely valuable. And we should continue to do that, even if it's overkill for the hardware we have today. That is the easiest step, in my opinion. But then there are other parties like NIST, which is sort of like a a pseudo government agency in a way, but they do a lot of standards research about how to create powerful encryption, how to watch for some of the new waves that are coming and protect against those. So it's the same reason, you know, NIST has been at the forefront of of moving to new encryption algorithms and for moving from SHA-1 to SHA-2 and then inevitably to SHA-3 to make things more secure for hashing purposes. Mm -hmm. So I think NIST is working on standards that will be more so quantum resistant. What those specific things are, I don't think we any of us really know yet because they, they have yet to, to release their findings in any real concrete way. But there are a couple of things that I've seen in research that could help prevent some of these problems for, for Bitcoin if we can start experimenting with them now. So first of all, let's address the mining side of things. What sure. does MIST stand for? Uh, it's NIST. It's the... NIST. Sure, yeah. So it is the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Dope. And what NIST does is it's a non-regulatory agency of the United States Department of Commerce. And, and the whole mission there is to promote innovation and make sure, on a side note, that innovation that we're doing is secure. Got it. Cool, man. So back cool. to your back to your list, sir. Yeah, no problem. No problem. So talking about the mining side of things and that 51% attack uh, vector... Uh, One way that I've heard of and I read in in a paper is to prevent that is to modify the mining process to make miners find hash collisions instead of hash values within a target window. So right now in Bitcoin, when you're doing proof of work and you are trying to find that solution, what you're doing is the protocol is giving you a target window that your hash value has to fall into. And you're rapidly trying to iterate one after another after another to find that hash value to be the first that fits into that window. I think a lot of people mischaracterize it and say you're trying to find one specific hash that's specific, an exact hash. That's so difficult that it just wouldn't happen. It's you're trying to find it within a window. And what you can do is you can make it slightly harder by trying to find hash collisions in a certain subset. And hash collisions are basically two sets of separate data that are different that produce the same hash. The whole point of a hash, though, is to create a fingerprint of a larger bit of data that's totally unique if you change one value within that data. Mm -hmm. So it's as you can see, it's a lot harder to find those instances where collisions occur than it is to create a hash of a a bunch of data. That's that's a pretty easy thing for a computer to do. Mm -hmm. So if you do that, you've made it then exponentially more difficult to to find that solution. And you've also taken some of the specialization out of the game in terms of. finding that target window instead you're it's literally just a a battle to the to the finish line like it like it's supposed to be that's one way of making it more quantum resistant making it much more difficult than it is today but also if you if you think about it we that's an intermediate solution because as time goes on you'd think that when quantum computing becomes available to consumers then just like asics anyone who's out there mining has access to that as long as the playing field is somewhat level the hash rate of the Bitcoin network is relative to what the readily available hardware is out there, right? Right. 
So that's one thing to note that I think that will be a more temporary problem. And in terms of keys and signatures, I was reading about something called XMSS. It's basically using Merkle tree related hash based signatures. They're a lot harder to crack in, in general than our traditional um, public private key RSA stuff. Right. So the other thing here is using these um, hash based signatures. They're more complex, first of all, and harder to crack, but you can also use them in a protocol as one time addresses. So you can constantly use that derived value tree that you have and use those addresses one time. So as one time addresses. So even if someone were to get a hold of it and brute force it and crack it, you've only used it once and there's nothing that anyone can gain from cracking it. Right. So the idea, too, is if even if we don't go that route, potentially not relying so heavily on weaker, smaller bit depth RSA keys could also help. If anybody's listening, they want a little bit more information about one Merkle trees, hashing, hash rate, blocks, any, anything about that. In the Crypto 101 community group, there is a paper that I put together that will tell you all about that. Or you can go to, of course, Forrest's channel. I bet you there's something on there. Uh, and of course, Mastering Bitcoin by Andreas Antonopoulos. There's a whole chapter just on this. So if anybody's going, what is a Merkle tree? What is meaning derived from you know different hashes? Just there's a lot of information out there. So take your time, get to learn this because it is honestly very damn interesting. And very powerful. <laughs> and very powerful. Yeah. Very, absolutely. Forrest, before we get off today, I want to say thank you for coming on and telling us about Quantum Computing 101 and talking about the future of Bitcoin in relation to the quantum computing threat. But I also want to ask you, what can people do right now to keep this conversation going? Because it is something that's going to be coming up. If we are pushing and we all are pushing for Bitcoin, cryptocurrency adoption, all of this is based off of a blockchain. This is a real threat. And we don't know. And like you said, it's not you're, you can't go buy water when the hurricane's right outside the door. So what do we do now to keep this conversation going? Yeah, I, I think first and foremost, it really starts with educating yourself. You know, there's a lot of resources uh, that you can find out there about quantum computing, about the theoretical threat that it poses to a lot of different aspects of the internet and the web today, uh, inclusive of Bitcoin and Ethereum and all these you know, cryptocurrency platforms. So I think that's the first place to start. Beyond that, I also think having those conversations and you know, testing the waters, talking back and forth, having that kind hearted debate about what the attack vectors are, when this is going to break ground, when you think quantum computing is going to start to really make that impact. And if you're a technologist, try your best to get in the game a little bit and ideate on how you can uh, contribute to the solutions. What is your prediction, man? If you're going to say, is it 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years out? When do you think that quantum computer is going to be able to break encryption, current encryption? Um, I think I'd be more comfortable making an estimate of when quantum computing is going to be capable of reaching some like even close to the potential that we've given it. And I think that is going to be within a decade. That's my opinion. And a lot of people think that's a really short time window. But throughout history, even though it doesn't look like we've got a lot to show for it, quantum computing is so far ahead of what we thought it would be at this time today where we sit that I am not betting against the innovators that exist on this earth today. I just won't do it. So <laughs> 10 years, 10 years, I think if we have waited 10 years to address this problem, it's already too late. The new IBM computer, which is one sleek looking machine, by the way, it looks so sick. Yeah, it's dope. How fast is that thing? How, how powerful is that thing? Do you know? Honestly, I was reading a little bit about it and I may be grossly misquoting this and I may be totally off. So again, forgive me ahead of time if that's the case. But my Green understanding is, is it's a feat of engineering in the, in the sense that they've been able to encapsulate this and make it work the way it's supposed to in a stable format. But its power is not any more powerful than a, you know, a reasonably powerful laptop computer that we have today. Okay. Um, and, and I believe that the main engineering feat that they've made there is that they have a stable quantum computing piece of hardware. And that is a difficult problem in and of itself. Right. That's something that hasn't been solved for a while. Quantum computing just la uh, lasted. It was in, you know, the quantum state for, you know, either minutes or seconds or milliseconds be before that. Isn't that correct? Correct. And so that is where we're at right now. That is the state of quantum. It is. We are essentially in the, we have a cell phone that works, but it's like a crappy user experience and it drops calls a lot, but it, it does work, right? Mm -hmm, it's not mm -hmm. that great, but it works. And you remember how quickly we went from that cell phone to iPhones to world domination. 
<laughs> exactly, exactly. And well, if if they have that thing uh, being stable and it's giving out the power of, say, my MacBook Pro, that's pretty damn good already. I Like you said, man, I'm not going to doubt the innovators or the diligence or the vision of a company, especially like IBM too get their shit together and get this shit working within the decade. So let's keep this conversation going. Let's keep talking about what happens, the worst case scenarios, and we don't want somebody to come in and rob the bank. Forrest, thank you very much for coming on Crypto 101. This has been a very informative, eye-opening, and not dis depressing, but cautionary and eye-opening conversation. I loved it, dude. Same here, man. Always love talking tech and always love talking to a, a fellow, uh, fellow crypto lover like yourself.